Hello and most welcome to 927 of the series. And I will discuss the book The Matter with Things by Ian McGilchrist. I have had the opportunity to dwell a little bit further into the book and it is getting progressively more and more interesting. One of the things that are very obvious is that he has sort of an appella, uh, uh, an evangelium, so to speak, an evangelium of how we can get to the reality of existence once more, how we can cut through those divisions that we make and enter totality and true uh, divisions, true limitations and true borders instead of the self-made ones. One could say that he's uh, on a mission to invite the world once more into the apeiron of Stephen M. Rosen where knowledge is, where we find true difference and where we can inform our doings and also progress as human beings. All these true promises, I would say, possibilities, things that are actually achievable, achievable uh, on a small scale but also on a big scale and how we can grow as human beings and to make the point more acute he has shown that um, he's mainly talking about right and left hemisphere but if you have too high a preponderance of left hemisphere domination which is the common trait in modern western society but it, if it goes even further which is, has become more and more common uh, we get schizophrenia on one end of the line but it's a graded scale autism is also a fairly new thing autism uh, did not exist to that extent at all before the 18th century autism most mainly is the person who cannot access both the whole and the particular at the same time. Uh, Ian McKeel, Chris also for, uh, thinks that the lighter afflictions like dyslexia, uh, inability to perceive colors as they are, symbol drawing, symbol drawing I would say 99% of the population do. It means that we don't draw what we see. We draw a symbol that is usually a token of that real thing. It's a two-dimensional sign for something. Another thing is Asperger and everything that is on the autism spectrum. And he is challenging the, the idea that it's uh, for the first something that is inherited by DNA or something and the second thing that it is not reversible. Because I would say, and I completely agree, uh, no, I would agree with Ian McKeel because of this instance, he is even talking about a specific philosophy. And what philosophy could that be he's talking about? Uh, he using here a site in the book. Tony Atwood and 
acknowledged expert on autism spectrum, writes that there is a quasi-philosophical quality to the autobiographies of adults with Asperger's analysis. What he is referring to is generally accepted to be an over-rationalistic, hyper-reflexive self-awareness and a disengagement for emotions and embodied existence, which is very much in accord with my own experience of looking after subjects on the autist, autistic spectrum. Moreover, there is an abstract quasi-philosophical mode of talking that is common in some kinds of schizophrenia. At first impressive, but ultimately recalcitrant to understanding, it's sometimes actually referred to as pseudo-philosophical thought disorder. Have you heard that? Pseudo-philosophical thought disorder. Both autistic and schizophrenic individuals have an antipathy to what is embodied, uncertain and unknown, or unknowable. Preferring what is abstract, certain and known, all of which are characteristics of the left hemisphere. And also this can happen when somebody is harshly forced to use his wrong hand when writing. This happened in the previous days. It's no, nothing, no longer a thing since the last 60 or 70 years. But it, people could actually get some sort of mild affection or disease from this. <clears throat> What does all this mean? Yeah, I would say the experience from the book, it seems that autism is something of a learned behavior. And it catches on early on. But the influence is around the subject all the time. Whereas the mother already in the womb is directed endogenous and being self-reflective, that automatically, automatically changes her whole system. The child in the womb are going to, is going to get affected by this and is going to sense less affection because we know slipping over to the left hemisphere gives less affection, less empathy, less sensitive to one's inner experience and to one's body, bodily experience. It means that you cannot access the information the body gives and it also means that you can't find pleasure in what the body gives. Uh, Ian McKilchrist also makes a comparison with alcoholism. In alcoholism it's always the case that the person has a dominance in the left hemisphere. The person has a lack from the start of feeling real, of feeling present, and all those things, and try to cure it somehow with alcohol. But the only thing that alcohol does is sort of extend the ego, so that blankness becomes a forgetfulness that is later interpreted at, as I enjoyed myself or something else similar. But you cannot enjoy yourself once you are in the left hemisphere mood. It's absolutely impossible. When the left hemisphere is dominant, the canal to the body and its pleasures, the canal to the reality and its delights is absolutely cut off. And cutting it off more and later design a memory making a memory, which is the ego does. The true self doesn't make memory, but the ego makes memories. It's an artificiality that is actually copied from the idea of the machine. Taking out a thing, uh, putting it on, on the construction band, uh, putting it together and then giving it the stamp of reality. Working thing, a little bit like the Christmas special uh, earlier in Swedish television where all the toys made in the toy factory of Santa Claus was stamped. 
especially uh, rememberable is the case when the dog tried to escape from the stamp, didn't want the stamp in her behind. This is what modern man do. This is how we construct what is called memory. Memory was until recently even an affair, something of an actuality within neurology. Very few people today believe in such a thing as a memory. It's an ongoing process and both projection or pretension and retention are directed active processes. There is no such thing as uh, a power, executive power of taking out the memory, looking at it and put it into action, into reality. It's not so hard to understand this model is taken from machinery and thank God it's absolutely clearly shown now to be false. It's a variety of representationalism that made this memory theory. Instead, training of the head to remember things, which I would say is different, is something that helps both pretension and retention. And we are not granted pretension and retention for free. We do no longer train that, and that is caused by education that relies on an unnormal random structure called memory. Memory can never ever work. So memorization is learning how to retain things, how to make up your past, so to speak. It's an active process and you need it for in concert together with pretension make up perception and the actual sense of nowness. Sense of nowness is no so much temporality as being aware. It has nothing of that nowness you can read in the New Age scriptures or the nowness of modern age or nowness of mindfulness. No, just the contrary. Nowness is awareness into the future, nothing else and all those platitudes are slowly disappearing and uh, for my own sake I feel a relaxation. I realize that these things are absolute nonsense. Mindfulness is nothing about sheer misinterpretation of something that is very far from being logocentric. Made into the adventure of the ego of the West, made into to the crusade of gaining once more Jerusalem, or in this case, true presence. It is something we acquired when we were very young, and most probably, as Ian McKilchrist already established in the womb, but it was incredibly enforced. The lighter cases of autism are usually things that comes up in the educational system you get affected, not necessarily so, but once you get affected with the representational idea of the educational system, you can be lured into the trap of self, direct self-reflection. And when, once, once self-reflection and self-identity are established, once more, it's the mirror, mirror image that helped me to understand this. Once this is firmly established, everything locks down. It locks to each other, it locks on the external world, and that vivid, lively thing that used to be the external world when we were young disappears out of vision and becomes this mechanical structure of memories. And the ego start working, putting the memories together with cause and effect, constantly reflecting upon them. A healthy human being doesn't reflect like that. This is something called rumination. A constant reconstruction of a subject, subjective swear that locks you out of your own reality and cuts your head off your body and you almost immediately slump. This slumpedness is your getting into the disbalance that you think is happiness. And that slumpedness is also the drunkenness of the person who wants to reach absolute presence 
by drinking or using drugs. Of course, drugs and alcohol can be very enjoyable, but then you need to be in the right hemisphere. In two senses. The correct hemisphere needs to be first dominant, and you also need to be present in the right hemisphere. Otherwise, it's just making up the fig afterwards. Now you say you enjoyed, but you just had an extended non-awareness of the ego, and then you felt to be in that now. But it's just sheer blankness. And uh, take it a bit further and you don't remember anything at all. This is what now is. This is what everyone is looking for. And they learn to appreciate that as it was some del delicious honey that could be mixed with the sweetest milk you can find and you put, put almonds into that. And that is supposed to be a healthy, soothing concussion for your much starved soul. But it's not. It lacks sweetness, it lacks creaminess, it lacks the crunchiness of the almond. It lacks everything. And of course, this is the quest of the left hemisphere. The left hemisphere cannot create pleasure, but it cannot create satisfaction either, that you stop at some instance. Because you just continue and continue and continue. And of course, as Ian McIlchrist shows, this has been translated into the modern educational system. This is what we see education to be today, trying to convince young school children that there is a world out there and that you can learn about that by starting a sort of a memory process where past movements or movements that possibly were transmitted from the book gets into your memory and they start to become uh, something of a memory bank and you arrange this in different orders and you ruminate about that. Rumination is what the cow does. It has food and it's one of its stomachs takes it up and chews it once more. This is what modern man do. This is the remembrance process. And if it's not learned in early school, it will be learned at some instant in the schooling. This is instead of doing pretension and retention. Now you are completely cut off your world. It's like you're looking at your own body and your own experience from an absolute distance. And you look at your memories sort of with a magnifying glass. And this is what the rumination does. It constructs uh, memories, objects in that memory's relation. And it makes the non-awareness of the ego taking more and more space and blocking all that lovely energy that we used to have in our experience and make these square things. Uh, something that uh, Edward de Bono called uh, stone logic. May his soul rest in peace. Close to the cemetery could be worth mentioning as well. Oddly, this technological memory process has also entered the dream state. Dreams that used to be that vivid, non-disclosed and uh, going everywhere and being fantastic has now become the reflection process once more, arranging thing, but in dream, of course, not in a regulated order, but in a bizarre order. But that bizarre order is just lack of the order you have in everyday life. It's not the same as creativity. The disruption of order tells modern man he's dreaming, where it used to be the case that dreaming was something great, something absolutely new, not a rumination of memory constructs. I started more and more to feel that that metaphor of the toy factory in this very old Walt Disney movie must be from uh, the 30s, black and white, 
is maybe some sort of precognition or something fantastic from uh, the imagination of uh, uh, the script writers or script writer if it was, was only one how memory can be artificially made so to speak and how the ego uh, is the one that puts the stamp of memories and put them in a, cer a certain order and that will be the equivalent of putting the toys into their different boxes depending on what sort of toy it was it was a little blonde girl or if it was a, a scarecrow or a, a, some stuffed animal or of the sort they all get different cages and we do the same with our memories and uh, we all feel that this doesn't have any liveliness to it it doesn't have any energy and it is sort of like the ego uses up all the energy that each moment gives by this constructing by this uh, tedious questions uh, of ontic nature what is that instead of asking the more pertinent action related how it is and why it is so we feel the lack of awareness we feel the lack of energy happiness enjoyment endorsement and also of self affirm affirmation because in some way self-reflection becomes impossible into the lockedness of uh, the metaphysics of presence we cannot access self-reflection anymore it becomes just a mirror image that doesn't give us any information it doesn't reach out enough to sort of be reflected back or bounced back so we can have a good look at ourself and have this hermeneutical circle as described by Martin Heidegger I instead it's rather a direct bouncing that doesn't give anything it's no intricacy on the self side and there's no intricacy on the exogenous side because slumpedness and lack of balance that is a bad start in itself that won't give any energy to the uh, experience and that in itself would be lack of awareness and then the ego constructs the idea of now and this becomes the heaven for the now this is the Liseberg uh, for the now the, the, the place of attraction it's constructed by the ego and it makes us want to go there even further and of course this is the image that we get hypnotized by in the description of uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein in Philosophical Investigations and also in the, red, uh, the blue book and the brown book this is what kept us uh, doing things still and today uh, the lure of presence is something that is the impetus of all our actions we wouldn't rise out of bed if it wasn't for the hope of gaining this presence somewhere so it's a self-constructed carrot very like the carrot we give a donkey that we want to move it's in front of it and it will always be in front of it because the construction is made that uh, already always at the beginning there is maybe a meter between uh, the mouth of the donkey and the carrot itself and that will make it keep going and there is al always a distance between this constructed idea of the presence and us ourselves that makes us going into that direction play to do it but we do it to much larger extents because we don't have this invitation to absurdity, paradoxality that can heal the situation. That allows us to take in wholeness by allowing all of reality to sweep into our awareness. Instead of 
intentionally blocking, out, blocking it out by slumping, cutting the actual physical connection to the body off. This is why we slump. There is a reason for slumping. And you can notice it's even more severe in people who are sick. They slump even more in the very, very narrow sense or the narrow wish of getting rid of the pain. They cut it off by slumping and the pain becomes an object. And as an object it becomes much more pertinent, much more terrifying, much more unknown. And this is a way of getting rid of pain that people used to know. Uh, I would see, say that modern man is the man that is plagued by pain, not the man of the distant past. We make pain an object of the ego because we cut off the connections to our body by diminishing the nerve ends that go through the neck into the brain we automatically cut it off we forget that we started to do that and we don't feel our body we don't feel our world anymore we don't get sensations instead we have them indirectly we own them but owning pain is not a pleasurable thing this way of having pain is much more strenuous. It takes over the field of awareness. Why is that so? It is because the ego sucks up all awareness, whereas ordinary awareness invites even more and more space and more time. In a way, it is not really hard to understand what does Metaphysics of logic, sense, um, metaphysics of presence, or metaphysics of existence, do to space. Well, it makes it smaller, narrows it, taking away the surrounding thing, saying the whole is of lesser value. Focus on the small thing, something that is so encouraged in the educational system. Cut the world off. Don't be in the world anymore. The same goes for time. We start looking for that small little thing of awareness instead of taking in the grand time, all of time. The more we take in, the more we can have the specific and we get stuck in this search for the specific which blocks out time. We get less time. We do the same on knowledge. We get scared on knowledge. It is scary with the knowledge that is not to construct of our own. We lose the power, we think. We lose the power to construct our own world. It's a, a horrible feeling at first, but then you realize it's so much better to be in the real world because there you have rules, there you have laws, there you have functioning thing instead of this simulacrum called Newtonian physics. But human beings, I would say, they are today most afraid of knowledge, more than anything else. And all of the educational system is directed against knowing. Pupils are encouraged not to feel their bodies by uncomfortable chairs and this restricted awareness of the subjects that are all divided into portions. We had at least 20 subjects in school and even languages, German, English, were divided even more instead of having a wholeness. And then the idea was the more you block out, the better it gets. It's a horrific thing to encourage pupils to do. I wouldn't say that everyone fell into that trap, but I can say it's a whole hell of a lot easier to do that when you have nine years of schooling sort of indirectly in a most tricky way encourage you to think in those ways and if you really fall deep down you will end up having the modern affinities of HDHD focusing problems constantly jumping from subject to subject 
in the search of complete presence and then you start this horrific process of uh, making up your own memories, memories in processing, rumination over and over again, sucking up all energy, constructing your own simulacrum that lacks everything of reality, everything of moisture, uh, temperature, elegance, all those things of the world. And where do you go after that? You block yourself even more in the hope of the futile hope of more presence. And then you start reading the National Encyclopedia. The Swedish National Encyclopedia trying to learn it by heart in a sort of very distorted view of the world. This is top of the educational system. This is caused by the educational system. It leaves you tortured, it leaves you without focus anymore, and it leaves you with a strangled body, and it's an invitation, invitation for repetitive strain injury. Things that are actually occurring already in school since the last decade. Isn't that amazing what we can do? But do not fret because all this can be cured. This is the message for, from not so much from Ian McGilchrist, but more from the deconstructionists like Robert Magliola, Rudolf Gachet, and of course Derrida himself. And the message is incredibly positive. I listened the other day to an interview of Derrida at the uh, Amnesty International seminar and when they asked him, why are you deconstructing the subject? And he showed in that seminar that he makes the subject much more interesting, much more vivid, and he doesn't destroy anything. He makes something that is already diminished to something much greater, many different relationships. And this is what deconstruction is. It heals everything by inviting radical otherness and it's also the most positive message to humanity. That's the idea that knowledge is a possibility. It's not like the educational system says you cannot know anything by maybe third hand or something like that. Or as Jan Ornberg used to say, I don't know anything about physics, space and time. He's living in space and time. He says, I delegate all that to the physicist, thereby giving up his own existence, not accessing the tremendous space we have around us. Enjoy it, enjoy the world, see what we have. All this is accessible in every single instance. We just have to put down our scare of knowledge for a little while. Don't give up all scare at once. Don't put yourself into an epileptic attack, but invite some knowledge. See it's not dangerous, see it's sweet like strawberries. See that it actually makes it possible for you to construct your own ideas. And that you previously, when you look back, you were completely upon, dependent upon others to share this uh, blocking out idea and it was nothing that came originally from you although it feels so heimlich it is what Heidegger would have called unheimlich unheimlich and with this view and this invitation to space time and knowledge I wish you all a pleasant afternoon and thank you very much